We are getting proper old school now when it comes to retro ups and downs because today we are headed to 1997, which is why I dressed how I looked 24 years ago. Which is not true. I never had hair this good. It basically escaped me before I was a mere adult. And I was never a pirate. So I'm just lying to you right now. Very sorry. But honestly, those 12 months may be some of the craziest when it comes to pro wrestling, even when we're not talking about the headline stuff. I mean, sure, Michael lost his smile and had to go home. There were rumors that WCW wanted to buy New Japan. Dennis Rodman went to World Championship Wrestling after he'd been negotiating with the WWF. And dudes like Ken Shamrock said, I'm not gonna do mixed martial arts anymore. And I'm gonna work for Vincent Kennedy McMahon. Out of all of these though, the one that affected WrestleMania 13 the most was when the heartbreak kid had realized he couldn't find his grin anymore so decided to go home because the plan or so it is said is that wrestlemania 13's main event would have been a rematch between bret hart and Shawn michaels although this time bret would win but given that Shawn michaels had also been told that he had to drop his wwf title to sid justice he thought to himself nope i don't want to do that so he left and of course there is talk about him having a knee injury or the fact that he was just so burned out from the road and the constant pressure he needed some time off and i I don't think we're ever going to know what the truth is, but ultimately it meant WrestleMania 13 had to change. And even though there was some worries that he may jump ship over to WCW, that was never going to happen because Shawn Michaels had a five year deal with Wild Wrestling Federation and they weren't just going to let him get out of that. Although Shawn Michaels did play this up crazily, as did Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. And as we all know, poor, poor Bret Hart didn't enjoy any of this. And when it does come to the actual event itself, well, it's not actually that good. We all remember it because of that one big match that we did have, but outside of it, there wasn't really that much interest in the pay-per-view. And looking back now, I can understand why. I mean, everything else is middling at best, but the reason that it gets us all excited in our groins and all excited in our loins is of course because of that submission match between Stone Cold Steve Austin and Bret the Hitman Hart. And as I'm sure you've already figured out all that you already know, this wasn't meant to happen, obviously, because of what we talked about earlier. So it was just hobbled together and it gave us, for what is my money, the best WrestleMania match in history. I mean, for starters, it was a submission contest and Stone Cold Steve Austin didn't have any submissions, but also these two were gonna try and pull off the historic double turn and that is no easy feat. It's also crazy violent. While it's hard to actually take that in now, if you are able to transport yourself back to 1997, it becomes very apparent that Vince McMahon's MO has become, hey, let's push the envelope and see what we can get away with and then just say sorry afterwards. It's why people started using swear words like shit, I think I'm allowed to say it now, and it's why we had some questionable angles that dealt with race. And we probably shouldn't have done that one, but you know the prelude to the Attitude Era, everything was on the table. While many of these weren't the answer, WWF was still able to put over 18,000 people in the Rosemont Horizon, but outside of this, nobody actually cared that much because it only did 237,000 buys on pay-per-view. And given that WrestleMania 12 had done about 290, WrestleMania 10 had done about 340, and WrestleMania 10 had done about 420, well, the graph was going in the wrong direction, which means nobody was happy. Worse than all of this, though, is that what the flub is that poster? I mean, for one, the company's name, someone just found word art and started mucking around with it. And then we just found some crappy PNG of some fire and then wrote heat underneath WrestleMania 13. I mean, it looks like I did it. Still, as you voted for it, let's get in our time machines and go back 24 years and up those downs. For WrestleMania 13. The best thing about this whole show, aside from Bret Hart versus Steve Austin, is the opening video package that uses one of these production themes that just makes me cry inside of my heart. Now, the one they do use here is actually used better at SummerSlam 97, but I don't care. And if anybody from WWE's production crew in 2021 is watching, please will you bring them back? They are so good and straight away. I was excited for WrestleMania 13 like I'd never seen it. And believe you me, I've watched it a lot. And I want more of this nonsense, especially the voiceover guy. He describes Brett and Steve as two angry young men. Bret Hart was almost 40. Also, I do believe this is the first episode of Retro Ups and Downs when Vincent Kennedy McMahon is the commentator and flubbed me sideways. He is just so good. Because you get the whole, bah, bah, and when he's doing pinfalls, he goes, one, two, oh, I didn't do it. I don't get how Vince does this with his voice. He is kind of projecting it, but also unprojecting it. 
I think he is vastly underrated. Do not forget what we said about WrestleMania 13 though, because the first match is the Headbangers versus Doug Furness and Philip Lafon versus the Godwins versus the New Blackjacks. And as we have talked about time and time again, if you put new, the word new, in front of anything when it comes to wrestling, you have already doomed them to fail. Also, what the hell would you do if he was still doing this today? Are we going to get the new, new day? And now that I've said that, I probably willed it into existence, but I think that goes to show how stupid this is. The new Blackjacks also get a promo beforehand, and my word, the moustaches, if you told me after this contest they had gone to star in a porn movie, I would have believed you. And also, as Barry Windham is cutting his promo, Bradshaw, who is beside him, is just going, <laughs> and then when he gets on the mic, he's, <laughs> He's just laughing the entire time, and I have absolutely no idea why. I mean, all of it felt like I'd taken a bunch of hallucinogens. And on that note, we have mentioned the Godwins, which means by law, I am required to remind you that yes, their names were Phineas I. Godwin and Henry O. Godwin, because when pushed together, they became pig and hog. I wonder why this gimmick never took off. McMahon also describes this as an unusual matchup, and I suppose that is kind of true, because it's one of the first occasions where the WWF had said, hey, we're gonna put four tag teams in the ring, and you can tag anybody that you want, including somebody else's partner. Now, why the hell you'd wanna do that if you wanted to win the match, I don't know, but it also falls apart instantly, because as soon as Mosh and Thrasher are in there, McMahon goes, oh, if they don't fight, they're gonna have to forfeit, so they push each other, and then they just tag out and nobody gives a crap. It's also a number one contender match, but there is no hoopla around that. And poor Doug Furness and Philip Lafon. While everybody else gets some kind of entrance, they walk out like they couldn't give a damn. And that kind of sums up that team. Otherwise, sheesh, this falls apart almost as soon as the bell rings. I mean, the new Blackjacks get disqualified because Bradshaw just attacks the referee. And then Doug and Phil, they're out of there because they start fighting with the new Blackjacks. So they get counted out. And then after about five minutes, Mosh hits this kind of jumping fez breast thingamajig and he gets the one, two, three. And I watched the whole thing and I had no emotion in me. None. I wasn't happy. I wasn't sad. I wasn't interested. I wasn't angry. I was completely neutral. And that's why it's got to get it down. So this is not a good way to start WrestleMania and neither is the next match, although it is a fascinating look into, well, where the hell are they now? Because we have the Sultan who would soon transform into Rikishi taking on Rocky Maivia, who I do believe came one of the biggest Hollywood superstars we have ever seen. It is also the perfect piece of evidence as to why everybody crapped over the great one when he did arrive, because he is the most cookie cutter wrestler you've ever seen. I mean, he's grinning and he's smiling and he's dancing. And actually, I don't mean to be this guy, but he is a little bit annoying. It's almost like he doesn't realize that he's being so over the top. And because he has no self-awareness, you're like, damn it, I just want to boo you. And I tell you, the fans are booing already. You even hear Rocky sucks. The Honky Tonk Man is also doing guest commentary for this match. So once again, I'm abided by law to remind you that this guy within the world of kayfabe thought, how can I be really successful at wrestling? How can I win champions? championships. Oh, I've got it. I'll pretend to be Elvis Presley. Good for you, Jack. I also don't really get, and nor did I back in 1997, who or what the Sultan is. He comes out with Bob Backlund and the Iron Sheik, and nobody actually explains why. And I think it was the whole, he can't talk because somebody cut out his tongue. So was I meant to think that the Iron Sheik cut out his tongue? But to be honest, Bob Backlund, he's so crazy, I'd actually put it on him. Otherwise, this is just something that could have been put on Raw. I mean, it's the least WrestleMania thing ever since Snooki had a match. And The Rock doesn't even get a proper win because he busts out the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment, the surprise roll up. And he gets a three count before he can even celebrate with his Intercontinental Championship. Everybody is just whooping his ass. This was, of course, done so Daddy Rocky Johnson could come down and they could have somewhat of a WrestleMania moment, which begs the question why we don't focus on this at all anymore. I mean, the fans don't buy into it that much, but it is kind of nice to see father and son together. But yeah, in 2021, it's kind of been buried. And I don't really know why, but still down. Although I do have to say the best part is when the Sultan has the rock in some kind of neck hand grip thingy and the rock puts his hand over his mouth and starts calling spots like this is going to be enough to know that he's not speaking. 
Like right now, you know that I'm speaking, even though that I'm doing this. I thought it was flubbing tremendous. Ken Shamrock cuts an interview next, and this must be the most calm version we've ever seen on Ken. And he's basically taking us through after he'd beaten up Billy Gunn on Raw, saying, well, now I'm doing this kind of MMA move, and now I'm doing that kind of MMA move. I wasn't going to break his ankle. I was just letting him know I could. All that really matters here, though, is that he's wearing a zip-up hoodie like I am now, but his zip is like down here, because you always, at all times, must see Ken Shamrock's pecs. We then cut to a promo between Triple H and China, and because China only just popped up in the WWF, Doc Hendricks is all like, oh, Triple H, can call him Triple H, not Triple H yet. Oh, uh, Hunter, uh, China, is she your boss? Is she your employee? Is she your personal assistant? And Hunter herself just goes, I don't want to talk about it. So you're like, well, that was a waste of my life. Honestly, though, you could tell someone that this version of Hunter Hearst Helmsley was the now Triple H's brother, and they would believe you because they kind of look the same, but they also look totally different. Let's head back into a weird time capsule because our next match is indeed Hunter Hearst Helmsley, not yet Triple H, taking on Gold Dust. And once again, imagine in 1997 you had told someone, well, the dude with long hair, he's basically going to be in charge of the company in a few years. And the other one, he's going to go to a company called AEW and be a pivotal part of their growth. I mean, when you said AEW, somebody would have gone Gesundheit. Otherwise, I quite enjoyed this. Up. For some reason, I remembered all of it as well. It just must be one of those random matches that is etched into my brain. But what I did not recall was when the two were fighting on the top rope and Hunter Hearst Helmsley pushed Goldust off and his face just goes smashing into the ring apron. And I will tell you this, that was not the plan. And you also see a pile driver mid-match and I went absolutely ballistic for that because that's like a UFO sighting in WWE 2021. In fact, you're not allowed to do it and you would probably get fired. So when they did it here, man, it was like my guts had come out of my mouth and just spilled all onto the floor. China and Melina, who were in the respective corners get into it at one point because of WWF and of course what does that lead to you already know the distraction because Gold just tries to help his wife but then Triple H rams into him and that sends Melina into China who ragdolls the absolute hell out of her honestly you have one shot and I was looking at Melina going well have they swapped that for an actual mannequin and Goldust is so terrified by all of this he gets hit by the pedigree one two three and sure yeah it is kind of just there but it is more than watchable and for all the reasons outlined it is fascinating and it is followed by that now kind of famous clip of Shawn Michaels not being sure how to use a laptop, which now when you look back, you think, well, what a moron, who can't use a laptop? Mr. Owen Hart then made his debut on Retro Ups and Downs, unless I've forgotten something, but I don't believe I have. We all know the tragic tale and how he passed away, but let's just move that over here for one second and remind ourselves that Owen Hart was such a good professional wrestler. He had such a good character. He had such good facials. He was just a tremendous performer all the way round, and it's what made his tragic death even more tragic. It is kind of a bizarre match as the teams are Owen teaming with Davey Boy Smith as the tag team champions, taking on Vader and Mankind, and who remembered when that was a thing. But people are so into Owen Hart and the British Bulldog, they get cheered even though they're meant to be the bad guys. Also, as we are talking about the Bulldog, it's the same with him as well. He was taken way too soon. And not only were they just great singles competitors, but as a tag team, my word, they're wonderful. And this really is great too, especially because nostalgia just comes flying out of the screen and smacks you right in the face. And the only reason it suffers is because once again, WWF had to go WWF. I mean, it's one thing on Raw, but to do it on WrestleMania, you've got to be kidding me. Because somebody had decided that nobody could lose here. So in our World Wrestling Federation Tag Team match, <laughs> both teams get counted out. Imagine we had done that at WrestleMania 37. AJ Styles and Omos taking on the New Day and it ends with everyone just falling out the ring. The internet would have exploded. But yeah, Mankind applies the mandible claw and then Vader just starts running around and he hits into everyone, which means they all spill out to the outside. So the ref just goes, one, two, three, four, five, seven, nine, ten. And that is that. Even still though, I had a hoop watching this up. It doesn't really matter though, because it's building to what's coming next, which is the submission match between Style Cold, Steve Austin, and Brett the Hitman Hart. There's no titles on the line here. It all came down to personal beef. And I swear, this thing is never gonna age. I mean, the amount that came out of this too and the direction it gave us and the performance from these two men, I truly do believe it to be one of the best matches in history, which is why it doesn't just get an up. 
who gets a golden up. It's also the sheer amount of barriers that they had to overcome to ensure they achieved their goal, such as again, yes, Stone Cold didn't have any submissions, we had to make the crowd believe, and the fact they needed blood, even though the official line was we weren't allowed to bleed in wrestling matches. It's why Hart spoke to Steve Austin beforehand and said, look, here's what we're gonna do, and if you don't wanna get any heat, I can be the guy to nick your head so it's all on me. We all need a friend like that. Otherwise, it's just ridiculous. I mean, the rattlesnake still gets a huge evasion when he arrives, so we are well on our way. But so does Brett the Hitman Hart, meaning they did have work to do throughout this whole thing, even though it had been teased leading up to it. And honestly, they couldn't have done a better job, which means it's perfect. I mean, don't forget what we did here. The Hitman, who had been the WWS best babyface for a while, was gonna end that. He was gonna become the biggest bad guy in the company. But in doing so, he was gonna take somebody else and catapult them to the top of the mountain. I mean, that shouldn't work. That should be a disaster. And yet it's the most beautiful thing you will ever see. You just need to watch it if you've never seen it because it absolutely is essential viewing. And by the time they're brawling in the audience, Fans can't believe what they're seeing. I know we see it all the time now, but this was 1997 when the world was in black and white. Maybe. Austin also whips Brett into the ring step, so Brett retaliates by going after Steve Austin's knee, and you can actually feel this thing building, especially when Brett Hart gets madder and madder that Steve Austin won't just tap out. The frustration is all over his face. And if you were a fan of his like I was, you were like, what's wrong, Brett? You don't usually act like this because apparently when I was a child, I talked like I was in Oliver. You see that figure four around the post, and that was more complicated than Einstein's theory of relativity when you were a child, because it just looked absolutely devastating. And then Brett takes this one step further, because he gets the ring bill, and he clocks Austin in the head. And that's not what Bret Hart does. I don't think he's having a good day. That's absolutely necessary though, because when Steve Austin starts to use chairs, you can't get mad at him because it was Bret Hart that insinuated all of this, and that's where the ring psychology comes from. He was just making it even. He even goes for a Boston Crab, which they tease is going to end the match, and then when he goes for a sharpshooter, do you know how Bret Hart gets out of it? He pokes Stone Cold right in the eye like an absolute dick. Austin is also bleeding like crazy after he gets thrown into the guardrail, and that's going to assist massively in terms of getting to the top and using iconic imagery. And then when Bret Hart goes to the sharpshooter, do you know what Stone Cold Steve Austin does? He pokes Bret Hart in the eye and just go back to what I said 10 seconds ago. He also follows it up with a shot to the ball. So Jim Gordon was right. It is all about escalation and you don't get mad at Steve because he's just doing what he needs to do. Hart then dings Austin in the head with a ring bell once again in order to get him in the sharpshooter. And you will have seen this scene time and time again. But oh my gosh, it still has all the drama. Shakespeare would look at this and go, my word, they did a good job. Steve Austin is in this move for ages as well, but the crowd just keeps getting louder and louder as blood does run down his head into his mouth. But never forget, he doesn't tap out. He doesn't say, I quit. It's up to Ken Shamrock, who, by the way, is a special guest referee in this, but you don't need to mention him up to this point because he's played his role so well to go, hey, that guy's passed out. I think it's over, Bret Hart, you win. Even then though, there's more work to do because as soon as Bret Hart does have his hand raised, the fans cheered. So what does the hitman do? He goes right after Steve Austin's leg after the bell. And that's when the audience realizes that their hero is dead. This only stops because Ken Shamrock suplexes him away from the man. And even then Bret Hart goes out of his way to put over Ken Shamrock because he looks at him like he's the most terrifying man in the world. So straight away, that's another dude who took a step upwards. Just to make sure that it is Stone Cold Steve Austin who is in our minds before we do go home for the evening, he makes sure to give a Stone Cold Stunner to another ref. And let's face it, we never look back from this moment, even when Austin would get injured. It is the absolute best, and it made me feel so good in here, AKA my tum tum. If you've never seen this, we cannot be friends. WWE was really smart with this card too, and while I doubt they knew how much of a masterpiece that was going to be, the next match is the Nation of Domination taking of the Legion of Doom in a street fight, and everybody just kicks everybody else's ass, and it is tremendous fun. Up. This is a really weird version of The Nation as well because it's Savio Vega, Crush and Farouk with Clarence Mason, D'Lo Brown and everybody else on the outside. And the guy making up the numbers for the LOD is none other than Ahmed Johnson. He's another guy I don't think we've ever talked about on Retro Ups and Downs and honestly, what an anomaly this man is. If you go and research him on the internet, nobody has a nice word to say about him 
and the only thing you get close to is why the hell did he used to wear knee pads on his elbows? And he does. He wears knee pads on his elbows. What a strange, strange human. He must have had something though, because I remember when he joined up with the Nation of Domination a few months later in June, I was so devastated and I was so upset. I even went and watched all of the WWSB supplemental programming. Hopefully they give me an update, even though I knew deep down they weren't going to tell me till Raw. But I still watch every minute because I'm an idiot. And it is just a war from start to finish and Hawk and Animal get an eruption of an evasion because they're in the hometown of Chicago. And then somebody has clearly been watching ECW in 1997 because we even just wheel out a bunch of weapons here and then everybody starts hitting everybody else. Johnson is also hilarious because he is not wrestling and he's just beating up people for real. I don't understand how somebody can be so stiff. And we've got tables, we've got nightsticks, we've got two by fours, we've got garbage cans. And the only real questionable bit is when we take some kind of a rope and we tie it around Ahmed Johnson's neck and then we kind of hang him. Peacock, if you're watching this, I would go and delete that right now. It really is just the Legion of Doom ruining everybody towards the end until Ahmed Johnson gets a 2x4, wedges it in his armpit and clocks Crush with it to get to win. But then he goes and grabs D'Lo Brown and he gives him the Pearl River plunge. And I was absolutely terrified because that's just a legitimate power bomb. He doesn't try and protect him at all. I mean, there is every chance that it wasn't planned. And of course, we send the fans home happy because the Legion of Doom bust out some Doomsday devices. I actually thought this was one of the better things on WrestleMania 13. I don't know whether that's a good or bad thing. But really, it doesn't matter because it all works very well is not true of our main event. Sid Justice versus The Undertaker was a rush together match anyway, given everything that we talked about earlier. But also, it's just two big guys who aren't really gelling well together. Shawn Michaels is also on commentary during this, and man, that guy does not give a shib. I mean, when he gets to the entranceway, he just does the NWO sign, which 24 hours later caused Kevin Nash to go on Nitro. Hey, heartbreak kid, saw what you did, I love you, man. So nobody here cared less. What I had totally forgotten is that Bret Hart always has a presence during this, because before we even get going, he is out here to run everybody down including looking at Shawn Michaels and calling him a pussy. That made me laugh. Brett also goes after The Undertaker and tells Sid that he is the real world champion, which doesn't end very well for him because one, Principal Seymour Skinner didn't appreciate it, but also two, Sid Justice just gives him a power bomb. It is surprising though, because it means there is so much shenanigans and so much nonsense in the WrestleMania main event, but once again, it truly needs it. And Taker and Sid do do all they can, but it just doesn't click, case in point. After Sid has slammed the dead man through a table, he puts him back in the ring and applies a chin lock for about a week. I mean, I think I grew a beard. The fans are also clearly done and Sid takes too much of this match to really G them up. Although that massively changes. When The Undertaker goes from the tombstone and Sid Justice reverses it and gives one to the Fiendarm, and this was like a Pearl River plunge moment, I don't think we should have been letting Sid Justice do tombstone pile drivers. It's then when the Hitman is back, but this time he's got a chair and he just pulverizes the hell out of Sid Justice, including after he's hit the power bomb and probably could get the win. But of course, because of that, The Undertaker is finally able to hit his tombstone. One, two, three. So Bret Hart has not only really cost Sid Justice the match, it also cost him his WWF title. On that point too, if anybody starts walking around and telling you, oh, WWF had the Undertaker streak planned from day one, no, they did not. This barely counts as a victory, and at this stage in 1997, nobody had even clocked it. What was awesome about this ending is that The Undertaker and Bret Hart leave WrestleMania just staring at each other, and we all know the feud they were about to go on, and it's a personal favorite of mine. There is another story as well when it comes to the WWF Championship, though, because this had been a title that had rarely ever changed hands, and here, at the end of March 1997, it had already done so five times. So the writing... Well, it was kind of on the wall. Because really, people were starting to notice, as they did with this main event, it just doesn't cut the mustard, and it has to get it down. And look, like I say, it had so many different owners, even I had a run, apparently. <laughs> That's why it sits in my house. I know. I'm a massive geek. And as always, I will give you Dave Meltzer's Wrestling Observer ratings so you have another opinion about WrestleMania 13. The opening tag match got minus half a star. Rock versus Stalton got one and a quarter stars. Triple H versus Goldust got two and a quarter stars. The Owen Bulldog tag match got two and a half stars. Austin versus Hart, five stars, you damn right. LOD versus The Nation got three and a half stars. And that main event got a kind of bad one and a quarter stars 
I mean, it is the main event at WrestleMania, and to be fair, Dave Meltzer kind of got it right. Now, don't forget to leave a comment below, and again, make sure you put your suggestion for a future retro ups and downs. Whichever four get the most upvotes then go into the poll next week, and the winner of a poll will be featured here. And make sure you like the video, share the video, and subscribe. Head over to whatculture.com where you can stay up to date with wrestling. Make sure you give us a follow on social media. And look, you're on YouTube. Go and watch other older episodes of Retro Ups and Downs, which is now Retro, Retro Ups and Downs. The Circle of Life. My name is Simon for What Culture. Thank you very much for joining me as always. And who knows where we're going to go next. I'm just going to thank you because flub me, I thought it was going to be Katie Vick. And it wasn't.